I'm Jordan Heston. I'm not a priest or a scholar. I'm an actor. I tell stories. I want to take you with me on an odyssey. Along the way, I'll tell you some of the oldest and greatest stories on Earth. The stories from the Bible. We come now to the tragic and triumphant coda of the New Testament. The Passion, Crucifixion, and Resurrection. And we return full circle to the city of Jerusalem, where our story begins and ends. After the fall of Rome, Christianity was ideally placed in time and space to flourish through the abandoned structure of the Roman Empire. But the Bible was still not widely disseminated. Nevertheless, Christian monks in Britain began preaching in the Saxon tongue. As Britain grew, the Bible was translated several times into the maturing richness of the English language. King Alfred the Great was credited with personally translating part of one version. Here's Moses exhorting the Israelites in Old English. Sisis so itia Abrahamus got from Shafta Freya, so sas feared wereth, modian meanroth, miter miklen hand. In modern English, that's, it is the eternal God of Abraham, creation's Lord, who this camp protects, valiant and powerful with that mighty hand. The 15th century brought a major milestone in human history, the invention of the printing press. The awesome power of the written word was multiplied a thousand, thousand times when it could be duplicated and circulated. This was of lasting, immeasurable benefit to the world and as it happened to the Christian faith. What do you think was the very first book Johann Gutenberg ever printed on his new machine? Of course the Gutenberg Latin Bible in 1456. By the 16th century, uh, thanks to Gutenberg, the Bible was available to anyone who could read, if you read Latin. William Tyndale made the first definitive translation into English and published it. But the English church proscribed its circulation, suspicious of the inherent power of the printed word written in language people could understand. A bishop bought most of Tyndale's stock and burned it. I'm glad, said Tyndale. I'll have money to print more, and the world will cry out at the burning of God's word. In the end, they burned Tyndale. Then Henry VIII authorized the publication of an entirely new translation based on Tyndale's work. He called it the Great Bible and ordered it distributed to every parish church in England so that all manner of persons, rich, poor, priests and laymen, lords and ladies, husbands, Wives may learn all things. Later, there were enough restrictions on this freedom to make one uh, Robert Williams write in the flyleaf of his copy, I keep sheep. I bought this book, price 14 pennies, when it was proclaimed that shepherds might not read it. I pray God amends that blindness. His prayer was answered. For long, under Henry and his daughter Elizabeth I, the Great Bible was read all over Britain. Elizabeth was succeeded by James, the first Scots King of England. Soon after he took the throne, he decided to commission a new, definitive English translation of the Bible. Classically educated himself, he appointed six different panels of 47 scholars in all to do the work. They met separately in Westminster, Oxford, and Cambridge each group working on different chapters for a, a new English text based on both Greek and Hebrew sources as well as the extant English translations it was to replace. When this was done, each panel sent representatives with its new text to a fourth panel, which wove it all into a final text to be submitted to King James. It was worth the work. 
In 1611, after seven years of effort, the King James Bible was published, and aside from its ecclesiastical purpose, was recognized as a great work of literature. It's described not only as a monument of English prose, but as the only great work of art ever created by a committee. After nearly four centuries, it's still used in English-speaking churches all around the world. Just as important, the King James Bible, along with Shakespeare, has helped shape the language itself. This means more and more as the use of English grows throughout the world, becoming the lingua franca of our time. If it can be said of any single published work, this is surely the Bible. Why is the King James translation so good, so clearly the best? What makes any writing good? Strong, simple sentences, vivid, active verbs and nouns, colorful images, good dialogue. When it's as good as this, it also touches the heart. Now let's begin the end of the story, or the end of the beginning. When Jesus and his disciples entered the city, the time of quiet preaching was past. Jerusalem was not a quiet city. Pilate, the Roman governor, had to deal with the zealots and other rebel groups. The priests of Israel had to deal with false prophets who distracted the people. The new ideas of Jesus were not yet widely understood or accepted, but they were popular. That made him dangerous. All four Gospels describe the gathering storm as Jesus surely now knowing his destiny goes to meet it the pharisees a strict jewish sect at the time would certainly have found christ's preaching objectionable smelling danger maybe blood in the air some of christ's followers begin to fade away though his original disciples stand fast for the moment Now there was much murmuring among the multitude concerning him. Some said, he's a good man. But others said, nay, but he leads the people astray. Still Jesus went up into the temple and taught, saying, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If any man wills, he shall know whether I be of God or whether I speak for myself. Some therefore said, is this he whom they seek to kill? Lo, he speaks openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the rulers know that this is the Christ? But some answered, We know whence this man is. But when the Christ cometh, no one knows whence he is. Jesus said, Ye know me, and know whence I am. But I am not come of myself, but from him whom ye know not. Now the Pharisees heard the multitude murmuring, chief priests sent officers to take him where he stood. But when they heard him cry, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Some of these men said, this is of a truth, the prophet, this is the Christ. Still some said, what does the Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that the Christ cometh out of Bethlehem? Still, no man would lay a hand on the chief priest said to them, Why did you not bring him? Are ye also led astray? The officers answered, There was never a man who spoke so. Now, after this, Jesus appointed other disciples and sent them two and two into every city and place. And he said to them, The harvest is at hand, but the laborers are few. Therefore, go your ways, yet beware. I send you forth as lambs in the midst of wolves. Still, into whatever city ye enter, say to them, the kingdom of God is nigh. I send you to tread upon serpents and scorpions, yet nothing shall hurt you, for your names are writ in heaven. Now, the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover, and many went up out of the country to Jerusalem to purify themselves. They asked there for Jesus in the temple, saying, 
What think ye, uh, that he will not come? For the priests had commanded that if any man knew where he was, he should tell it that they might take him. So the Pharisees took counsel how they might do this. And they sent forth spies, saying, Master, we know thou art true, and teachest the way of God, and careth not for anyone. Tell us, therefore, what thinkst thou? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar, or not? And Jesus said to them, Show me a penny. And they brought him a penny. And he said, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said, Caesar's. And he said, Then render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. So they held their peace and went away. Now since the Passover was at hand, the priests and the scribes and the elders of the people gathered together in the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted how they might take Jesus by craft and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest a tumult arise among the people. Now Jesus was in Bethany at this time, in the house of Simon the leper. And as he sat at meat, the woman Mary Magdalene came with an alabaster box of precious ointment and poured it on his head. When Judas Iscariot saw this, he said, to what purpose is this waste? This ointment might have been sold for much money to give to the poor. And they all murmured against her. But Jesus said to them, Why trouble you the woman? She hath wrought a good work. The poor ye have always with you. But me ye have not always. She hath poured this ointment for my burial. And I say verily, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there this also shall be told, what this woman hath done. Then Satan entered into Judas, though he was one of the twelve. And he went away to the chief priests and said to them, What will ye give me if I deliver him to you? They weighed and gave him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought to betray Jesus. This is the Hall of the Last Supper. The room's been rebuilt often most recently by the Crusaders, but this is said to be the place where Jesus gathered his disciples for that fateful dinner, the night of his betrayal. I said before, Jerusalem's a city crowded with spiritual significance. One floor down lies the tomb of David, ancient king of Israel. Do you suppose Jesus knew that? More important, does he see the web of plots around him? The the small traps laid. He handles the question of paying Roman taxes easily enough. Does he know Judas will defect even before Judas does? In these last scenes, the central issues, the core of the New Testament, is Jesus the Messiah. My teaching is not mine, but his that sent me, he says, and with these words seals his fate. But first there's the feast day, Passover. He will not be taken then, the priests say, lest there be an uproar among the people. So there's time for a quiet meal with the disciples, the breaking of bread and wine, the first communion, and for Jesus, the last Passover. Now, the first day of the feast, the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them and made ready the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve and sat at meat. And as they did eat, Jesus rose from the supper and took a towel and girded himself and poured water and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them. So he came to Peter, who said, Lord, thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. 
What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt hereafter. Ye are clean, but not all are clean. So he sat down again and said, Know ye what I have done? Ye call me master and lord, and ye say well. But still, I say to you that one of you shall betray me. His hand is with me on the table. Twelve looked at one another, doubting, and said to him, one by one, Lord, is it I? And he answered, He that dips his hand with me in this dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written. Then Judas said, Master, is it I? Jesus answered, Thou hast said, What thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew what he spoke to Judas, who went out straight away, and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, Children, yet a little while I am with you, so now a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. By this shall all men know ye. Peter then said, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered, Whither I go, thou canst not follow. Peter said, Lord, why can I not follow thee? I will lay down my life for thee. Jesus answered, Wilt thou lay down thy life for me? First, sit down and count the cost. Ye know not what ye ask. Peter said, Even if I must die with thee, I will not deny thee. And Jesus answered, Verily, Verily I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. For I say, This which is written must be fulfilled. So he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them. And they all drank of it. And he said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which I shed for you. But I will no more drink of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let not your heart be troubled. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go, I come again, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know the way. Thomas said to him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How know we the way? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one cometh unto the Father but by me. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. Jesus said, Have I been with you so long, and dost thou not know me, Philip? I am the Father. Ye know him. He abides with you. I will not leave you desolate. Yet a little while, and the world beholds me no more. But ye behold me. Because I live, ye shall live also. Let not your heart be fearful. If ye love me, rejoice because I go. And now I have told you. I will speak with you no more for the world cometh. Arise, let us go hence, that the world may know that I love the Father. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is come, that ye shall be scattered, every man, and leave me alone. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So they came at last to a place named Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, Abide ye here while I pray and watch. And he went forward a little and fell in the ground. And he said, Oh, my father, if thou be willing, Take away this cup from me. 
Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt be done. And in an agony he prayed, and his sweat was as great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And as he rose up from prayer, he found the disciples sleeping. And he said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he turned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he said to them, sleep on now. Take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is taken. And while he spoke, Judas came, and with him a band of soldiers with swords and torches. Jesus therefore went forth and said, Whom seek ye? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Judas came to him and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Jesus said, Friend, do that for which thou art come. Then they came and laid hands on him and took him. Now Peter had a sword and drew it and struck one of the high priest's servants. And Jesus said, Put up thy sword. This cup the Father hath given me. Shall I not drink it? So the chief captain bound him. And Jesus said to him, are you come out to take me as a thief with swords? When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hand against me. But this is your hour, and this is done. Then the disciples forsook him and fled. The events of that final supper and the night in the garden are full of terror and betrayal, and faith and friendship and wonder. Christ, who's faced this from almost the beginning, has to decide what to tell the twelve of them and how. That done, he wants most to get it over. Do it, he says to Judas. Jesus comforts the eleven loyal apostles that are left, then goes to the garden to meet the soldiers. Maybe he thinks they'll be waiting there with swords. One strong, bloody stroke and it would be done. But they're not. The garden's empty. He must wait. For the first time in the entire Testament, his will falters. Perhaps for one moment he's not the Christ, but the man struggling with his mortality who prays, please, don't let it end this way. This is said to be the very garden. This, the very rock where Jesus prayed for strength. From this moment, he is who he is. He smiles at his sleeping friends. He... Can they really have been sleeping? That's the sort of human frailty that, to me, rings true. Jesus calls his betrayer friend. He greets the soldiers like guests in his garden. He practices what he preached. They take him and his disciples run away. Every man of them runs away. This is the Via Dolorosa, in the old city of Jerusalem. The buildings are more recent, but these stones are original. Jesus may have stumbled here as he dragged his cross up towards the hill of Golgotha to his destiny. There's still the trial to come and the cross. The lines of inevitability are closing towards a climax, which perhaps could be foreseen, but not avoided. I think Jesus knows this now. Philippians says it very well. Christ, equal with God, was made in the likeness of men. As a man, he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now they led Jesus away to Caiaphas, the high priest, and Peter followed, afar off. They brought him even into the palace of the priests, where were assembled all the elders and scribes. But Peter was standing without in the court. When they'd kindled a fire, he sat with the servants. And 
warmed himself. Then the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none, though many bore witness against him, for they agreed not together. But at last came two false men swearing, this fellow said, I can destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, answerest thou nothing? What is it which these men witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. So the high priest said, I command thee by the living God that thou tell us, art thou the Christ? And Jesus said, Ye say that I am. Why ask thou me? Ask them that have heard me. They know the things which I said. Then the high priest said, What need we any further witnesses? We ourselves have heard from his own mouth. Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? They answered, He is worthy of death. Then the men that held Jesus spit in his face and mocked him. And others blindfolded him and struck him, saying, Prophesy to us, O Christ, which is he that struck thee? Now Peter still sat without, warming himself, when a maid came to him and said, Art thou a disciple of this Jesus? And he denied, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And then another maid saw him and said to them that were there, This fellow was also with the Nazarene, and with an oath he denied again, I know not the man. And after a while, another that stood by said to Peter, well, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean. <laughs> Thy speech betrays thee. And he swore, Man, I am not. And at once the cock crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus. Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me. Christ. And he went away and wept. Now Judas, when he knew that Jesus was condemned, repented. So he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the priests and said, I have sinned. I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. So he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and went away and hanged himself. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they'd bound him, they led him away and delivered him up to Pilate. Pilate, therefore, said to them, what accusation bring ye against this man? They answered, If this man were not an evildoer, we should not have delivered him up to Rome. Pilate said, Take him according to your law and judge him. The priest said, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, but we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest I am a king. To this end am I come into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? Now again the priests accused Jesus. So again Pilate asked him, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they accuse thee of. But Jesus no more answered anything, not even one word. So the governor said to the priests, I find no fault in this man. But they were all the more urgent, saying, He stirs up the people throughout all Judea. Now at this feast, the governor was wont to release to the people one prisoner, whomsoever they would. So Pilate called together the priests and the people also, though the priests had delivered Jesus to him for judgment. So Pilate said to them, Ye brought me this man, and having examined him before you, I find no fault in him. Nothing worthy of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him for your Passover. Would ye that I release to you this 
king of the Jews. Now there was one named Barabbas who'd made rebellion and for this and for murder lay bound in prison. So now the priests moved the people so that they cried out, not this man, but Barabbas. The governor said to them, which of the two would ye that I released to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what shall I do then with Jesus? And they all cried, let him be crucified. Then Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out the more, crucify him. And these voices prevailed. So Pilate, to content the people, released Barabbas, whom they asked for, and delivered Jesus up to their will. The soldiers took him and scourged him, and they plaited a crown of thorns, and they put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple garment. So they brought him out again, and Pilate said to the people, Behold the man! But they cried out as before, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! When Pilate said, Shall I crucify your king? They answered, We have no king but Caesar! And they mocked Jesus, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! So they took the robe from him and led him away to crucify him. Jesus went out bearing the cross for himself. But as they led him on the way, they took hold of one Simon of Cyrene and laid the cross on him to bear it after Jesus. And a great company of people followed after him, and women also bewailing and lamenting. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never gave suck. Then shall they say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in the green time, what shall be done in the dry? And when they were come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of the skull, they gave him wine to drink, mingled with gall. When he tasted it, he would not drink. And then they crucified him, and sorted his garments, casting dice among them, what every man should take. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And now it was the third hour, and they set up over his head his accusation. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Now many read this, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew and in Latin and in Greek. The priests, therefore, said to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. And Pilate said to them, What I have written, I have written. And the people stood there and watched him. Also the elders, nodding their heads and saying, He saved others himself he cannot save. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe him. One of the thieves which were hanged railed at him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God? We received due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing. And he said to Jesus, Lord, when thou comest into thy kingdom, remember me. And Jesus said, I say to thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise.
There, standing by the cross of Jesus, were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, and Mary Magdalene. Now it was about the sixth hour, and a darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, the sun's light failing. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he said, It is finished. And cried, Father, into thy hands. And thus he gave up the ghost. This is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, built on the hill of Calvary, or Golgotha, meaning the place of the skull. Many believe it to be the site of the crucifixion. The story can be told for the awesome drama it surely is, or whatever else it may or may not be. Neither Pilate nor Caiaphas is a villain, both are committed men, which is more than can be said for Peter here. Pilate, as Roman governor, shows Jesus to the people. Ecce homo, he says. Behold the man. The mob rejects his offer of clemency, allowing Pilate to wash his hands of the matter. Jesus hardly speaks. He certainly makes no effort to defend himself or even seek mercy. He too is committed. To this end am I come into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Perhaps Pilate's comment is the most telling. What is truth? And who knows the answer to that? The resurrection has been endlessly debated, but is, of course, ultimately neither provable nor disprovable. It's said by some to have happened here on the second day after Christ was crucified. In 1883, General Gordon of Khartoum spotted a hill with a strange skull-like look to it. Beneath the hill was a garden which research showed may have belonged to Joseph of Arimathea as a small tomb carved from the living rock. There's a track where a stone could be moved to seal the entrance or rolled away. Whether Christ's tomb was here or beneath the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is for theologians and archaeologists to debate. To me, it doesn't really matter. The resurrection is the crux of the New Testament, the focal point of the Gospels. Christ, having delivered his message to mankind and accepted the burden of their sins, comes back from the grave, both to reassure his disciples, to forgive Peter's denial, and significantly to provide reliable living witnesses to his resurrection and inspire them to spread the word he'd given them. All four Gospels describe this in detail. Still, to accept this witness requires an act of faith, the very act of faith which I suspect was the entire point of Christ's teachings and the New Testament itself. Now the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion that stood by over all saw what was done, he said, Truly, this was a righteous man. And all the people that came there smote their breasts and cried. And all that followed him from Galilee and the women stood afar off, beholding these things. And now when the even was come, because it was the day before the Sabbath, a man named Joseph of Arimathea, a good man and righteous, who'd also been a disciple, came and went in boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. So Joseph took him down from the cross and wrapped him in fine linen and laid him in his own new tomb, which was hewn out of a rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and also Mary, who came with him from Galilee, beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. They returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested on the Sabbath day, according to the commandment. Now, as it began to dawn on the 
first day of the week. They came to the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door? But when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away. In entering into the tomb, they saw an angel sitting on the right side. His appearance was as lightning, and his garment white as snow. And he said to them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified, is risen. He is not here. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. So go your way. Tell his disciples that he goeth before you, but ye shall see him, as he told. And Peter ran and looked, wondering at what was come to pass, for they had not known that he must rise again. And they rose up and returned to Jerusalem, rejoicing, The Lord is risen! But Mary Magdalene stood still at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she turned, she saw Jesus standing there, but she knew him not. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they've laid him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, whom seekest thou? And she said to him, Master. So he said to her, Mary, touch me not, but go to my brethren and say, I ascend unto my father and your father, to my God and your God. And she went and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and what he'd spoken. But one of them, Thomas, said, Unless I see in his hand, the print of the nails and put my finger there I will not believe so that evening Jesus came where the disciples were and stood among them and said peace be unto you and to Thomas he said reach hither thy finger behold my hands and Thomas answered my Lord and my God then Jesus said Thomas because ye have seen me, ye believe. But blessed are those that have not seen and believe. And to Simon Peter he said, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? And Peter answered, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. And to all he said, As the Father hath sent me, even so I send you. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Now of the things which Jesus did, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books which would be written. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And the Word endures. Words enrich us, define us, they mark our place in time and in the universe. 